Sex is fun, but that's not why we do it. It's only fairly recently that evolution grew it. Still, I hope we'd all agree when all is said and done that we do like sex. Sex is fun. I acknowledge that not everyone here will be able to comment on that, but at some point in your life, possibly you will be. Of course, most creatures of Earth don't even do it at all. They just split in half and then off they crawl. Then homosexuality was the first revolution. There was only one gender for most of evolution. Now we have genders, but not just two. Some species have dozens. Yes, that's really true. Then we have all those whose gender bends. They switch back and forth. It just never ends. Fish girls become boys, become women, become men in this cycle that repeats again and again. Even when our gender stays fixed, things still get a little mixed. XO, XX, XXX, XX, 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 XX. That's just the female sex. XY, XXY, XXXY, XX, XXY, XYY. There are all kinds of variations on the male side. And if you think that's a little absurd, the whole thing is reversed when we come to birds. I'm an XY, but a boy bird is ZZ. And there may be more we don't know about yet. I'm not really sure about reading this one here in the chapel, but anyway. <laughs> sea sponges can have sex or do it alone. On a whim, they can mate or they can clone. Of course, when they do have sex, there is no penetration. They just squirt it all out and hope for fertilisation. <laughs> Those sponges have orgies of unheard of degrees. Think about that when you swim in the sea. <laughs> Too much? Creatures that do penetrate usually have no fun. Just to survive is the main rule of thumb. Male spiders get eaten, unless they're clever. Lots do it once, most bees do it never. Birds orgasm in the blink of an eye. Antichinus do it, then crawl off and die. But bonobos, that's a kind of chimp, do it with whoever they can, and then they do it again and again. Sex seems to be fun for so many primates, especially bonobos and us hairless apes. But sex is dangerous, you get dead a lot. So why did life just say, I'd rather not? Sex in all its forms has evolved to help us to fight off the common cold. Well, really to fight off the more deadly types of viruses, bacteria and parasites. We shuffle the deck when we combine our gametes. It's infection by germs which sex evolved to help us defeat. Sure, we love sex now and we think it's great, but it evolved to help us recombinate. And if there were no germs, there would be no sexuality. A whole lot of fun came from avoiding that calamity. Now, while drawing morals straight from evolution would be really kind of dumb, sometimes so is quoting Genesis like some God-given rule of thumb. Some say God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. But we know that's rubbish. First, all sex was same sex and didn't life flourish. Often at a wedding you will hear that God gave marriage. But sometimes that can be a bit of Genesis-inspired baggage. Evolution tells us that it certainly took a while, and it's not like Western monogamy is the only human style. Sure, marriage is great for a stable society, but that's the very thing Jesus threatened. He died a man of notoriety. Yet my wife and I subscribe to it using contraception. Well, most of the time there's been two conceptions, a lovely little boy and another just arrived. The planet's overcrowded, but we're still glad they survived. Other friends have no kids, though they have often tried. And it doesn't help when people say, no, it's for God to decide. Babies come when a sperm makes it to an egg, not when God decides it. We don't have to beg. Now, sex to get our kids was a highlight bar none, but we're not having any others, and sex is still fun. At least I hope it will be after I get the snip. It's lucky I'm not a Catholic, but a Protestant. <laughs> These days Christians say sex is great for a married woman and a man. The problem is they often then say that nobody else can. But any ethic which ignores the fact that we've evolved is an ethic that will leave many problems still unresolved. I can't give you all the answers in a silly little poem, or if it did it wouldn't all rhyme and I can't stand that. <laughs> but by now it should be obvious to any sensibilities that heterosexual marriage doesn't exhaust all possibilities I can't vouch for bloke to bloke though about it many rave or where there's only women but for some friends that's the fave enough already you either get the point or you stop listening long ago if you haven't started having sex you should probably take it slow sex should be a lot of fun but it isn't always so 
Sex is spiritual, mystical, emotional, relational, luminous, numinous, even educational. The Bible had a point when it says it makes us one, even if it evolved to avoid those pathogens. Now the poem's nearly over, and because I am a priest, I'll leave you with this little thought, which might be a start at least. The future church calls people to love of God and neighbour and self, to relationships which express a righteousness which is modelled on Jesus the Christ, informed by evolutionary biology, and appropriate to our current context. Freed from a simplistic application of Genesis with its very static view of creation. It's from a talk I gave last year, the internet it's on, Google Christian Sex and Evolution, and then add Jason John. <laughs> So we're still roughly on time. So just to summarise, in case you were so entranced by the poem you didn't get all the points, what I'm wanting to do is highlight some differences in the way Genesis has understood uh, the origins of sex and sexuality and relationships and the way evolutionary biology suggests it. So the main point is sexual reproduction has evolved. At first there was uh, no sex at all, organisms just cloned in half and then continued. Uh, then there was uh, unisexual, or if you want to be a bit cheeky, homosexual uh, relationships. That was, there was only one gender in all of life. But then it became increasingly useful for some organisms in the species to actually hold on to their gametes and just wait and collect the gametes that were floating around. It made it more likely that they would be able to successfully have offspring. And that's where male and female started to eventually evolve. And now we have heterosexual relationships. But birds have evolved down a completely different path than us. So in birds, it's the female that has different sex chromosomes, the kind of XY, and the males are um, XX, but they call them Zs. So there was no gender, then there were dual genders, and now there are variable genders. Some organisms have dozens of gender. Okay, all gender is really is working out within a species whether two members of that species can breed or not. Okay, so if you take... Uh, something from the male gender and female gender, you can get an offspring from the male and male you can't, female and female you can't. But for some organisms, there's about 12 different varieties, so you've got to get compatible genders amongst all of that. Sex initially evolved as an advantage against pathogens. Okay? That's the best uh, story that people can come up with as to why we have sex, because it takes so many resources, it's so dangerous, that's the reason we do it. And there's been an expansion of the function of sex. It was all about reproduction and survival. In the mammals, and especially in primates, it's also become about pleasure. And primates, particularly bonobos and chimpanzees and humans, now have sex just for fun, with absolutely no thought of reproducing. And in fact, in some humans, we now actively try not to reproduce while we're having sex. So in terms of the relationship between parenting or partnering and sex in life, it went from there were no parents, you just split in half, then there was no parenting. For most of life, organisms have just tried to have offspring and then leave them to their own devices and see what survives. But increasingly, over time, more and more creatures have put more and more investment into actually trying to nurture their offspring into the future. And of course, we're probably the prime example of that. The relationship of parenting and sex in us, it's thought that for most of our uh, history, human beings have been nomadic, and monogamy actually hasn't been all that common. We're talking about small groups of people, maybe 50, maybe 200 people, travelling around this vast world, rarely coming into contact with other tribes, and when they do, sometimes exchanging uh, partners. There was a shared care of children. There were no possessions to worry about. There was nothing to hand on to your children to make sure they inherited and nobody else got. So there was a much different attitude to reproduction and to looking after children. And everyone needed to cooperate together to survive. Tribes and groups that didn't cooperate well, that didn't all look after each other's kids, tended to die. So polygamy was a huge uh, part of human sexuality and relationships and continues to be in a small form around the world. There would be a lot more of it except for the fact that Christian missionaries, as they travelled around the world, insisted that people become monogamous. There have been a bunch of marriage forms. I'm not talking about it next week. We'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, polygyny is pretty rare, where there's um, only one woman and several men, but that has existed, and various forms of monogamy. And now we have sex without parenting for fun. So when we kind of compare the, the uh, impression we get from Genesis with what the evolutionists are encouraging us to look at, um, 
Genesis assumed everything was fixed. We all know the story. God said this and it happened. God said this and it happened. God said this and it happened. Everything in its place and its time and according to its kind and fixed. And we've tended to run with that assumption. But life is much more fluid and adaptive and evolved than that. And driven by the environment and context, and I guess that's the one point I want to make, life for hundreds of millions of years has adapted uh, the relationships between organisms and the way they have their children according to the environment that they're living in. And I think we see that in the Old Testament and the New Testament and today. So we're going to go on to the Old Testament.